Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a different kind of inauguration, and one that appropriately falls on Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, the inaugural event of the Moral Courage Conversations. Reverend King exemplified freedom of conscience, and that's what the Moral Courage Conversations are meant to explore, the future of free thought, free expression, and free conscience in a fragile and fractured world. Now, to give full credit where it's due, you should know that the Moral Courage Conversations are inspired by another iconic public figure, Robert F. Kennedy, who advocated speaking truth to power, even at the price of personal backlash. As he told South African students in the midst of apartheid, and I quote, few are willing to brave the disapproval of their fellows, the censure of their colleagues, the wrath of their society. That's why moral courage, as he called it, is rarer than bravery in battle or great intelligence. And yet, he went on to say, it is the one essential, vital quality for those who seek to change a world that yields most painfully to change. And as Senator Kennedy delivered those words at the University of Cape Town, he knew that to demonstrate integrity, he had to engage in self-criticism about segregation back home. What a week for us to affirm how moral courage can, in fact, change the world. But our challenge, ladies and gentlemen, runs deeper than defeating legislated segregation or even swearing in a non-white president. Now more than ever, our entire globe is steeped in the politics of identity which compels talented individuals to conform to groupthink, to the religious, cultural, and ideological correctness of their tribes. I must tell you, I've witnessed it on university campuses throughout North America, Europe, uh, Asia, Australia. Today's rash of tribalism produces a superficial, even dishonest diversity. That is to say, different identities at the expense of different ideas. Well, the day has come for diversity to mature. Hence the Moral Courage Project, which mentors students to bust out of self-censorship and communal orthodoxies in pursuit of a greater, more common good. And to bring that message to public audiences, we're now launching the Moral Courage Conversations at New York's crucible of big ideas, the 92nd Street Y. Just want to take one more moment, and that is to thank our other active supporters of this series, the Ford Foundation, the European Foundation for Democracy, which counters authoritarianism and promotes universal human rights. In fact, the executive director of the European Foundation for Democracy has flown all the way from Brussels just to be here tonight. And it's got to say something on this particular weekend that she would make her stop New York City instead of Washington, D.C. Very thankful to her for that. And finally, thank you to our other major supporter, NYU's Robert F. Wagner School, Graduate School of Public Service, whose research center for leadership and action is the physical home of the Moral Courage Project. A number of its team members are here tonight as well. Get to know them. Now, on with the show. And with one of our lifetime's indisputable exemplars of moral courage. He's an artist who has outlived the very cleric who condemned him to death. In continuing to breathe and create award-winning literature, he gives us all 
the audacity of hope that there is some measure of justice for those who choose freedom over fear. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sir Salman Rushdie. Ready? Yeah. All right. As you only too well know, we are hitting the 20th anniversary of Iran's fatwa against you. Now, Salman, I've been doing my research, and on the 10th anniversary, you wrote this in a column. When asked about the effect on my writing of the 10-year-long assault on it, I've answered lightheartedly that I've become more interested in happy endings, and that, as I've been told, my recent books are my funniest, the attacks have evidently improved my sense of humor. Which raises a counterintuitive question before we get to the negative. What, if anything, has been the positive social effect of Iran's fatwa on you? The effect, you mean positive for me? No, I mean for society. Oh, for the... If any. Well, it's difficult to see that. But well, I mean, I think there are some positive things. I mean, for a start, it's shown us the nature of the problem, you know. I mean, I think it was, at that time, um, more surprising, perhaps, than it would be 20 years later in the light of everything else that's happened in, in the next few So it was, I've often compared it, you know, there's that scene in Hitchcock's movie, The Birds, where, um, Tippy Hedren's chopping vegetables, you know, and, and you cut outside and there's one crow that comes and sits on the roof. And you cut back inside and she's still chopping vegetables. You go outside and there's a thousand crows on the roof. I mean, I think I was the first crow. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think... I mean, just to say the other positive thing, I yeah. think, is that it did, one of the things that I experienced in those years, and actually remember more than I remember the hostility was the incredible courage of ordinary people. You know, I mean, if you think that the threat was not just me, in fact, you know, in fact, I was probably the best protected person of all the people being threatened. Uh, but, you know, there were anonymous phone calls to publishing companies, you know, secretaries answering the phone would be told, we know where your children go to school. Um, there were attacks on people working in bookstores, you know, there's pipe bomb in Cody's bookstore at Berkeley. There was, a, I mean, a number of, and those people who responded to that uh, by being determined not to be cowed, you know. And so I found myself at the middle, not just of a, 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 a storm of hostility, but also of a demonstration of human beings behaving at their absolute best, you know. And, and actually, I remember that now with greater force than the other thing. And I think what we learned was that, to put it at its simplest, if we do that, we can actually defeat the threat. And that's what happened in that case. You know, the, the, there was an attempt to proscribe a book which is available in 43 languages at the last count. And there was an attempt to silence a writer who's, I'm afraid, sitting here talking. Mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, so it was a small victory. And I think that's a good thing to remember. Before we move on to the larger war, mm. um, which is, are words that you've used uh, mm. in my presence, why do you think the controversy over the satanic verses was and remains so intense? Well, look, there's, there's a number of ways of answering that. First of all, a lot of the people who got worked up about it were led down that path by others and didn't themselves bother to read the text that was problematic, you know. So, there, I mean, I had this experience some time after things got easier, where I, I met a young, actually British, um, Asian guy who confessed to me, under prodding from his girlfriend, <laughs> that in the bad old days he had been one of the organizers of demonstrations uh, against the Satanic Verses. And then he said, um, and then he said, but. But um, 
it's okay because I'm an atheist now. <laughs> and, and, and I said, well, that's, you know, progress. <laughs> and, and, uh, For and, some. And, no, lots, actually. Um, <laughs> and, and then he said, and they said, anyway, then I recently I read your book and I couldn't see what the fuss was about. Uh, and I said, yeah, you know, asshole, but <laughs> you were the person making the fuss. You know, so I think there's been a certain amount of that. You know, the, a, a lot of it was just people being told there was something to be upset about mm -hmm. and agreeing to be upset without bothering to discover what the facts were. Um, and there was some, there were clearly uh, political motivations of different kinds in different places, you know, people trying to make political mileage for themselves. You know, Khomeini himself facing the calamity of the end of his Iraq war um, with many, many, a whole generation wiped out in Iran and the revolu revolution probably m at its all-time low of unpopularity. Right. You know, I had the misfortune of being Khomeini's last stand, and, and there's that. But I mean, I, as I've thought about it, I've come to think that it was actually about something much more uh, profound than that. You know, in, in, in this, I mean, a lot of it, as I say, was superficial and, you know, manipulated, manipulated and ultra-political ultra and, and ignorant. Right. A lot of it was that. But behind it, there was this other issue, which I call. Uh, the argument about who had control of the story, you know, and, and I think that's really, to put it this way, I think we all as human beings have always told stories as a way of understanding ourselves, you know, and from the beginning of time, we've, narration has been the way in which we've tried to answer the question of origins and the question of, you know, um, morality and, and, and so on, and we are, we are this thing, we are the storytelling animal, you know, and we are the only creature that does it. And there's something very important to us about telling ourselves the story of ourselves. And then we get into these big stories, you know, the so-called grand narratives of nation and history and religion and family and so on. And, and, and we all live inside these stories and with these stories. And, and in an open society, we constantly reevaluate and argue about and change the story. You know, in the story of this nation, we must remember, particularly at this weekend, once used to say that slavery was acceptable, right. you know, and, and then there was a, that evolved, um, and now the story is different. You know, the story of this nation used to be that, you know, women didn't have the vote, or that sexual orientation was problematic unless it was conventional, and so on. In all these ways, we, you know, a free society argues about disputes, tells and retells and changes its own story. And an unfree society is one in which you're not allowed to do that, in which somebody says, I tell the story. And not only do I tell the story, but I tell you what it means, and I also tell you in what manner the story could be told. And if you divert from any of that, if you speak in an inappropriate manner, or you attempt to say that the story could have another meaning than the one that I impose on it, we will come after you. you know? and, and that's I mean, in any tyranny, not just a religious tyranny. You know, that was true in the Soviet Union. It's to an extent true in, in China now. It's, it was true in you know, Idi Amin's Uganda. Um, where I was born? Where you were born, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this, this question of who has power over the story is absolutely central question to the question of freedom. And I think that's basically what people were saying. They were saying to me, you can't tell this story, you don't have the right to this story, only we can tell the story, and what's more, we'll tell you how to tell it, and what it means. And because I was trying to do something else, they came after it. And I think in, in the sense that there was a serious reason, that was it. I think. What has changed for the worse since that time? You, you oh. started our conversation moments mm. ago with the words, the problem. We've mm. come to see what the problem is. Well, one of the, one of the things that's changed for the worst is that it's happened a lot more, um, and on a much bigger scale, and that people are much more afraid. They are, aren't they? Yeah, and I, mean, I think so there has been a, uh, a chilling effect. Now people think twice before they make a remark about, well, I mean, almost any remark about Islam they will think twice um, in case somebody decides to be offended. Um, this culture of offense that's grown up, 
You know, it seems now we're talking about identity politics. It seems as if an important aspect of identity is that things offend you. I mean, who are you if you're not pissed off about anything? Right. You know, you're, you know, right. you, you've got Where do no, I belong if I'm not angry? Yeah, you've got no culture. You know, your culture is the things that annoy you. You know, and, and, and the more things annoy you, the stronger your culture is. Right. You know? And the more uh, right you uh, are. Yeah. The more righteous and exactly, right exactly. you are. Exactly. So this, is, this has grown up this cult, uh, in this 20 years, this culture of offendedness. You know, where, I mean, actually, I get offended by stuff all the time. It, I mean, it doesn't occur to me to kill anyone. You know, but, I mean, maybe that's my mistake. <laughs> um, Excuse me while I end the conversation now. <laughs> You know, it's interesting how many people, at least in my experience, and I'm willing to bet yours as well, still don't get it. Uh, mm. I know of a group of young Muslims right here in America who had a contract with a major U.S. publishing house to release, get this, the first ever reformist translation, reformist translation of the Quran. Mm. And after the riots over the Prophet Muhammad cartoons, this publishing house pulled the contract. Mm. Uh, these kids could not get another contract as a result of that chilling effect and had since had to self-publish the book, which is why you've never heard of it. And if you've never heard of it, chances are you're going to assume it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I feel, I, I believe I should say that that feeds into the low expectations yeah. that so many non-Muslims have of Muslims. So yeah. it's interesting to see how the actions of non-Muslims also very mm -hmm. much influence the struggle for freedom of conscience yeah, no, I mean, I found among myself, Muslims. I found myself constantly obstructed by the fear of other people. Yeah. You know, um, the, by the uh, fear that other people have. The fear that other people had. And so and you, uh, the trouble with fear is that it's not susceptible to reason. Right. You, know, you can say to people, here are 72 reasons not to be afraid. And they'll say, yeah, but I'm still scared. You know? So it, that's the problem. Once people get into the kind of fear mindset, it's, very, it's, it's paralyzing, you know? and it, it makes it very difficult to, to, move, to move forward. And, and one of the sad things of inside the Muslim community is how much that has spread inside the community. You know? And it didn't used to be like that. I mean, in my lifetime, it's changed. But if I think about my parents' generation and the world in which they lived, the dialogue was completely open. Nobody was afraid to discuss things. Nobody felt that they were going to get into trouble if they made some kind of dissenting noise. And many of the cities of the Muslim world, like Beirut and Cairo, for example, were considered to be great intellectual open cities, you know, and indeed were. I mean, I remember, you know, my father was a much greater um, Quranic scholar than I am and spoke and, you know, could read and study Arabic, had done Arabic and Persian at university. And, and he, I guess, it's his fault, actually. So, that's, so it's, it's, I mean, he's been dead a long time, so I can blame him. Um, but he once, he, he told me about how, about the actual Quranic text and the way in which it's problematic. You know, I mean, as you know, um, the Prophet Muhammad was probably illiterate. And, um, and certainly mainstream Muslims accept that yeah, argument. Yeah, and so he never wrote it down himself. And, and what would happen was that he would go up the mountain, Mount Hira, outside Mecca and receive the prophecy, which also came in very different forms. And this we know from the traditions of the prophet himself. That he said sometimes he saw an angel, sometimes he only heard anything, something. Sometimes he would say it seemed to come from within him. It was often physically painful, he said. Some, so, sometimes so much so that he would fall down on the ground, you know, in, with pain. Reeling with pain. Yeah. And it, interestingly, this description of the mystical experience is very similar to other descriptions. It's very similar to, for example, Joan of Arc or St. John the Divine, etc. And so you begin to see that there is a phenomenon here, which is the nature of mystical experience. And clearly he was having this kind of experience. And he would then come down from the mountain and dictate to whoever happened to be to hand. Because he um, himself was illiterate, he himself, therefore could yeah. not transcribe these yeah. revelations himself. Yeah. So now you have, a, you have a problem. If you are asked to believe that the text is is perfect, is, the, is, is, a, is a perfect work, and is the uncreated word of God. That's what you're asked to believe. So first you have to believe. And sometimes commanded to believe. Yes, when I say asked, I use the term loosely. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, 
So you, you have to believe the following things. You have to believe first that when the Archangel Gabriel was receiving the message from God, that he retained that message with 100% accuracy. You know, now, okay, Archangel, probably good at his job, so let's, you know, we could... <laughs> <laughs> We could, Didn't rise to that status for nothing, bro. We could probably, I know, exactly. Yeah. He's top, just top winged guy. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, by the way, physically very large. Um, the prophet would describe him as standing on the horizon and filling the sky. So, a big angel. You know, not an angel to criticize, and accuse of having got it, made mistakes. So, let's assume that the angel got it right. Then you have to assume that the prophet, receiving the message from the angel, remembered that message with 100% accuracy while he came down a mountain after having had a very painful mystical experience. You know? But he remembered it with 100% accuracy and then repeated it with 100% accuracy to a scribe who took it down with 100% accuracy and then put it in a chest. And there was no attempt to collate these texts during the prophet's lifetime. It was only after he died that people, the, the close friends who had been involved in, in, in the process of transcribing, gathered together to try and remember what came first and what came after. And now we have to assume that that meeting resulted in a text of 100% accuracy. Right? And only then can you begin to believe that this is a perfect text. And as my father said, when you read the Quran, you can see quite clearly where the mistakes are. Because there are moments where a chapter will suddenly, without warning, change direction. Ah, but that's um, God's will. And 50 pages later, the sort of broken strand will return and be completed. So it's quite clear that this got a bit jumbled. And my father's plan was to put it straight. <laughs> His plan was to go through the Quran and unscramble it so that it made more sense. You know, that's a useful social function, he thought. And, um, thank God he never did it. <laughs> Otherwise, this could have happened to him instead of me. <laughs> um, but as I say, what I'm saying is at that time, when I was a kid, when I was you know, 10, so half a century ago, um, nobody felt that that would have been a worrying thing to do. And it was the kind of thing that people talked about all the time. So in this generation, this half century, the loss of intellectual freedom in the Muslim world is, is one of the really the most, the, one of the saddest uh, things that's happened. And, and that's, in my view, very largely a self-inflicted wound. I want to get back to the Quran uh, mm. in a few moments because that does figure prominently in the solution that you believe mm. uh, you know, needs to be proposed for the lack of intellectual freedom among Muslims. But let's talk just a bit more about the problem. Mm. And you say that that's largely a self-inflicted wound, which we'll explore momentarily. We were talking earlier, though, Salman, about what non-Muslims do that also feeds into mm -hmm. the problem. And I remember you telling me at one point in a private conversation about a campaign in Britain that was spearheaded by then Prime Minister Tony Blair mm -hmm. um, to create a brand new offense. Yeah. Your involvement in opposing that campaign and then the remarkable upshot of it. Tell us that story. Well, what happened is that Blair realized that the, the Muslim community in England didn't like him because of the Iraq war. Um, I mean, many other people didn't like him as well because of the Iraq war, but he felt that there was a danger of the Labour Party losing the Muslim vote, which it had usually had. And so in order to try and appease them, he came up with this law, which was supposed to, it was called the law, which was against the, the crime involved, was the, the crime of the incitement to religious hatred. That was what it was called. And, and essentially, when it became law, it would have become almost impossible to be critical of religion, um, and that any texts that you wish to publish would have had to be approved by a government minister before they were published. And so it was clearly, in terms of free speech, very problematic. Um, the law, in the end, failed in the House of Commons by one vote. Uh, and as it happened that night, Tony Blair went home early. So the, so the law actually failed because he wasn't there to vote for his own bill. And it's at this kind of point where you begin to wish, you almost want to believe that there is a God. 
<laughs> and a merciful one at that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, one with a sense of humor. You know. uh, but I have to just, there's a very, the, the funniest moment of this was that the other, I mean, I was very involved in this campaign, and the other person who was very involved, who's normally a very shy, retiring individual, is the comedian Rowan Atkinson. Um, Mr. Bean. Mr. Bean, yeah. So Mr. Bean and I went to Whitehall. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> to, to argue this out, you know, and there we were with these government ministers who had a big problem, which is that they were all Rowan's fans, you know, and, and they were some want, of them your fans as and well? Some of them, yeah, okay. but, but, but in this story, the, the thing that's relevant is they all loved Rowan and they wanted Rowan to love them back, <laughs> and, 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 and he was not doing so. Um, and there was moments, as I say, he's very softly spoken, Rowan, but, and so he, he said to them, he said, you see, let me give you an example. He said, recently in my television program, we had a, a bit of stock footage, I believe in fact from Iran, of, of people at Friday prayers. And over that, I had a voiceover in which I said, and the search goes on for the Ayatollah's contact lens. <laughs> <laughs> And he said, so, so would I be able to say that or would I in fact go to jail? <laughs> and the, the government ministers kind of collapsed in confusion. They said, no, no, humor, we're all for it. Absolutely great thing. You could certainly jokes, we're in favor of them. And that would be all, that'd be all right. And he said, well, how would I know that it'd be all right? He said, well, all you'd do is you see there'd be this government minister and he would tell you it'd be all right. So you just said, give it to him. And he said, oddly, that doesn't make me feel reassured. <laughs> anyway, so this was the campaign. As I say, it, it ended up, um, failing by one vote, by one vote. Otherwise, that would now be the law of England. I'm mm -hmm. curious if you know why Blair went home early that night. Did he think, seriously, did he think that he had it in the bag? No, he thought he'd lost by more. Oh. Um, he, he, his, the whips made a mistake. They told him that it was gone, you know, that the, the majority was large, and therefore it, there was no need for him to stay there because it was gone. And as it happened, it wasn't at all. Wow. And you see, had he been there, the vote would have been tied, and then the speaker would have to cast the casting vote in favor of the government, and so it would have been carried. Um, and so, there we are. So, moral of the story, if the whips can make a mistake, surely the Prophet Muhammad's transcribers could too. Well, that's, that's, that's well, I don't know how good the Labour Party are compared to the, the faithful, the, the, the close companions of the Prophet, but that's a whole other conversation, I feel. We, uh... <laughs> yeah. We human beings are prone to error, I suppose, yes. is the well, other the way thing. of putting it. Well, that's the thing, and yeah. perfection is not, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's absurd to assume perfection, yeah. because perfection exists nowhere. One more current affairs mm. note. Um, as you probably know, members of the United Nations are now seeking to criminalize mm -hmm. criticism of religion. Mm. They call it defamation, but really it yeah. is, as you pointed out in the other story, criticism. Mm. Here's what I find really interesting. The United Nations is mandated to uphold what we call the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, that declaration itself is um, rife with contradiction. On the one hand, it affirms everybody's freedom of expression. On the other hand, it clearly states that nobody should have his or her honor, and it calls it honor, violated. Mm. This is exactly, as you know, what many Muslims say is being violated by your books, by my books, by everybody's freedom of expression, if they feel offended. Mm. Given this contradiction between free expression on the one hand and the uh, you know, decree not to violate honor on the other, under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, how do clear thinking people navigate that paradox? Dishonorably. <laughs> I mean, I think honor culture is a very dangerous thing, and you know, we come from it. You know, and, and the thing about, I mean, to put it very simply, you know, Judeo-Christian culture has at its opposite poles sin and redemption. Um, there's no original sin in Islam. Um, there's no idea of original sin. So the question of sin and redemption doesn't exist. What, what exists instead at the opposite poles are honor and shame. Right. And, and, uh, and that's what mobilizes these kind of strong feelings. 
The trouble with honor culture is if you look at the way in which it's actually been applied inside the societies which hold to those values, is first of all, it's been used immensely to oppress women. Mm -hmm. uh, women are believed to be, that oddly, honor is believed to reside in the male, but shame is brought about by the behavior of the female. Um, and so in order to prevent the man from being shamed by the behavior of the woman, you have to stop the woman doing more or less anything. Um, some of this is, is you, know, you know, ludicrous and comical. Um, I mean, I remember at the early days of the Iranian revolution when a number of bizarre issues like this were being debated by the, by the Ayatollahs in Qom. One of the questions, I mean, this is, a, a, you know, seriously, this is not a joke. One of the questions that was asked was if a woman is wearing head-to-toe chadar, but she's wearing Western clothes underneath, she's wearing a skirt underneath, is that okay or not okay? I mean, given that she's completely covered, right. um, and all you can see are her eyes. Right? And it was decreed that it was not okay. And the reason it was not okay was that the friction of her thighs against each other inside the skirt would generate sexual heat. And this heat would be transmitted through her eyes <laughs> um, to, to men who observed her and might inflame them in various ways, and that, of, of course, was not acceptable. So, no. The best of these arguments, actually, had to do with the limits of incest. Do you know this one? I don't this think is, so. True. They, had to, they, had, they were asked in Qom to, to determine what is okay and not okay. Can you marry your first cousin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the question arose of the aunt by marriage. Was that an incestuous relationship? If you were to have relations with your aunt by marriage, I mean, it might be improper, you know, and upsetting to your uncle. <laughs> 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 but, but was it actually incestuous to have relations with your aunt by marriage? And at the end, they decided that it, decided that it was incestuous and not to be allowed, but there was an exception. The exception was if you were not able to control the entry into your bed of the aunt by marriage. Uh, what then followed was not your fault. And, and for example, they said, if the aunt by marriage lived in the bedroom upstairs and the floor collapsed <laughs> uh, and the aunt by marriage landed in your bed <laughs> from above, well, no man could be expected to restrain himself. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I'm telling you these as kind of funny stories, but you can see that the, the problem of honor culture leads to these kinds of appalling aberrations. Right. And at its worst, of course, leads to the phenomenon of honor killings, yes. um, where, which, which sadly are not less prevalent than they used to be, more prevalent. It, it, it raises such a fascinating distinction that I'm not yet sure uh, most uh, even liberals um, in our society yet appreciate, which is this, that just because human beings are born equal does not mean that cultures are too. Mm. Cultures are not born. No. Cultures are constructed, mm -hmm. which means that there's nothing sacred about cultures and therefore nothing blasphemous, sacrilegious, or inconceivable about uh, reforming the most malignant aspects of them. Yeah, I remember soon after the excrement hit the ventilation system, um, <laughs> um, I, I remember being sent as a gift by, uh, by a fan, a t-shirt, which I started wearing actually, which, which said blasphemy is a victimless crime. And given my own belief in the absence of anyone to blaspheme against, um, that seemed right. But I mean, I think, and actually let's remember about blasphemy, that in the history of freedom of expression, it's been a, an important weapon. You know, that in the 18th century in France, at the time of the French Enlightenment, um, after all, the ideas of the Enlightenment as imbibed by Thomas Paine crossed the ocean, came over here, and became the ideas on which this country was based. You know, so it's, so it, these are, it's an important moment. Um, it was quite clear to people like Voltaire and Diderot and Montesquieu that their primary enemy was not the state. Their primary enemy was the church. Um, that it was the church with its, inqui in, its inquisitions and anathemas and, and so on, uh, which was trying to place limits on thought. Like, you know, so far, no further. 
think this, you can't think that. And it was clear to them that that was the thing that had to be overthrown. And so their project often quite directly targeted religious anathema by the use of blasphemy. So for instance, Diderot's novel, The Nun, La Religieuse, was an example of that. And, and it is, there's no question that the great achievement of the Enlightenment writers was in fact to end the, the business of inquisitions and so on and to create a world in which religious orthodoxy could not place limiting points on thought. Um, that if religious people didn't like it, they would just simply have to lump it. You know, grow up, deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and out of that comes the whole modern definition of free expression. It comes out of that battle. And now we're fighting that battle again. I mean, different religion, different priests, exactly the same issue. Who gets to say where you should shut up? Mm -hmm. And the answer is not the Ayatollah Khomeini. You know, please. Otherwise, nobody can speak except him. You know? and, and that's why it comes back to what I was saying before. It's a question of power. It's not, in the end, a question of theology. It's a right. question of power. Uh, and, and again, to that point, uh, it's also, uh, as Salman is the first to acknowledge, not just about Islam anymore. I mean, just last July, actually, the uh, Catholic Church in Sydney, Australia, won the, quote, right not to be offended for an entire month. Mm -hmm. uh, Sydney police acquired brand new powers to prosecute uh, anybody who offended participants of the Vatican-sponsored World Youth Day. Mm -hmm. uh, even if the offending person showed up with a t-shirt that bore some irritating message. Uh, and the punishments ranged from, this is ironic, partial strip searches uh, to fines of $5,000 and yeah, more. Yeah. Uh, all in the name of cultural right. Yeah, but everybody's, everybody's jumped on the bandwagon right. is what's happened. Yeah. You know, that you now have, I mean, a couple of years ago in, in, in England, the Sikh community succeeded in, in, in protesting against a play written by, I mean, a person not unlike yourself, let's say a believing Sikh playwright. Mm -hmm. who, and she had written a play about, essentially about sexual harassment taking place inside a Gurdwara, a Sikh temple. And, um, you know, the, the powers of, that be, of orthodoxy protested against it, and the government refused to defend her. And the local police refused to protect the theater. Right. Um, it's happened in India now. It's happening a great deal where, with Hindu fundamentalists who've decided to target su successive works of art. Um, the movie Water by Deepa Mehta, which was Oscar-nominated a couple of years ago, was originally going to be filmed in India. And, and religious fanatics literally destroyed the set. Hindu fanatics. Hindu fanatics. Destroyed the set, delayed the filming by many, many years, and in the end it was filmed in Sri Lanka. Um, the great grand old man of Indian painting, M.F. Um, Hussain, who's now 93, I think, um, has been unable to return to India for many years uh, because he painted a series of paintings of Hindu goddesses in the nude, and this was considered to be obscene. Although the truth is, anybody who knows anything about Hindu art is that Hindu goddesses have no clothes. Right. You know, I would, I would like to see a picture of, from any age of a Hindu goddess with a substantial wardrobe. You know, I mean, uh, they, they actually, they're always in the nude or very near it. And so the problem was that he was a Muslim painter painting a Hindu goddess. Mm -hmm. And that's why they attacked him. So the politics of identity so, strikes again. So it, yes, it is. I think it is true to say that it is still more prevalent in the Islamic world than anywhere else. Right. Uh, but it is catching on. Yeah, and I think it's also fair to say that, uh, apropos of who you see up on stage, that there is a life and death difference between the fundamentalisms within Christianity and Judaism today and that within Islam, in that. For the most part, you can dissent within Christianity and Judaism today and generally not worry for your life. Mm -hmm. The same absolutely cannot be said within absolutely. Islam today. Absolutely and so not. that leads me to uh, circle back to a point that you made, but I'd like you to flesh it out a bit more, which is you believe that the Quran, Islam scripture, is at the heart not just of the problem here, which is the literalism with which the Qur'an is mm. treated, mm. but could also be part of the solution. Mm. Tell us how. Well, how long have you got? 
<laughs> well, few I minutes. think the audience yeah. loves you, so we've yeah. got a few, we can few stay. moments. All right. Yeah. All right, well, look, here's the thing. I mean, I was a history student, and I actually studied this period, the period in which the Quran um, showed up. And when you know the history of that period in Arabia, it illuminates the kind of book that it is in, in, in all sorts of very interesting ways. I mean, for, you know, to give you just one example, this was a moment at which the Arabs were just beginning to stop being nomads and to build cities, to become, to build settled communities. Mecca, at the time of the Prophet, was only about a third generation city. You know, so it was, it was uh, until then, nomadic culture had been the norm. One of the things that happened in the shift from nomadism to urban, urbanization is that the legal systems of Arabia changed from being matriarchal, which they were in the nomadic world, extended families, etc., cetera, um, matriarchal descent. Mm -hmm. of, uh, and they changed from that to patriarchy and linear families, and nuclear families. Um, what this did was to disenfranchise a large number of people who would have been looked after in the larger umbrella-like structure of the nomadic matriarchal family. Suddenly, under patriarchy with property, settled property and so on, being inherited through the male line, there were these mobs of people who were excluded suddenly from that project. Disenfranchised. Yeah, and very poor and in bad shape. And so the, 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 you could easily see, uh, and I believe it's actually correct to see, the, the ethic of the Quran, of the early Quran, as being an attempt to, uh, as being a plea for a return to the values of nomadic society in this new world. And so it's in fact, if you like, it's a conservative text which says things were better before. Can't we go back to how things used to be when people were cared for more um, and not live in this way? Now this conservative philosophy became a radical philosophy because it attracted the attention of that disenfranchised street mob and mobilized them and therefore became revolutionary and so it began to be persecuted. And that's how, the, that's how it begins. Now, it seems obvious that the social and economic conditions of Arabia in that period are relevant to the way in which the text came to be. The, the Bible stories in the Quran um, are very odd. Uh, and that's because the Prophet Muhammad, long before, he didn't become a prophet until he was over 40. Um, before that, he was, as you know, he was a successful merchant. And on the caravan trails, um, in the oases, a lot of the, the work in the oases, like you know, people who ran Osler's places and, and, and inns and so on, were Nestorian Christians. Uh, Nestorian Christianity is the desert variation of Christianity and it often adapted Bible stories to desert conditions. The versions of the stories that exist in the Quran are almost exactly the Nestorian versions. So that, for example, in the chapter called Maryam, which is about Mary, Jesus, um, Christ is born in an oasis under a palm tree. And that's exactly the Nestorian story. So again, if you know about the life of the Prophet Muhammad and where he went and where he would have heard these stories, it becomes clear that that's how the book came to be what it is. Mm -hmm. But if you believe that the book is dictated by the Archangel Gabriel and is the uncreated word of God, then you can't listen to this stuff, right? And so it means that you can't look at the book as an event inside history, which is a great shame because of all the sacred books, it's the only one which really can be looked at as an event inside history, where we know so much about what was going on around it, you know, much less so the Old Testament or the New Testament even. Right. You know. um, all that is banned information. So it seems to me that in order to open up, if you like, the, 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 the stifling atmosphere inside Islamic culture, you need to open up the discussion of the text. And until you do that, there will be this um, closed down intellectual world. You know, if all you can do is say, yes, you know, it was the Archangel Gabriel, you can't learn anything about your, the origins of your own culture. You know? One of the ironies um, that I think needs to be brought out here, going back to the phrase, not the book, but mm. the phrase, the satanic verses, is that that legend mm. within Islam actually suggests 
the Prophet Muhammad's own fallibility. Mm. Uh, the, the, the legend very briefly is that the Prophet accepted heathen uh, verses um, in the Quran um, and then later retracted them, mm. uh, realizing that they actually deify idols rather than God himself. Mm. So that if the Prophet, and, and he called them the satanic verses, so that if the Prophet is capable of making mistakes and good Muslim men follow in the path of mm. the Prophet, the Sunnah of the Prophet, then clearly his companions, the people who transcribed the mm -hmm. revelations, also. and also, exactly, mm. and, and, and yeah. men and women after that well, are capable prophet, of making mistakes. Prophet Muhammad himself was always very clear that he was in no sense divine, and, and, and in fact criticized Christians for having made a god of their prophet. Um, he said that you know, he was only, as he himself called himself, the messenger, you know, and, and in fact one of the reasons for dislike for, for, for the ban on representation is that he was worried that if people made pictures of him they would worship the pictures and so on and he, he very much wanted to see himself as a man bringing a message from God rather than as in, in some way divine himself and that ironically has gone out the window right you know this religion started by a man who wanted not to be seen as divine uh, now sees him as divine, a religion which, which, in which there is no requirement for a priest class at all, in which the, the, you, you need nobody to intercede with you, uh, with God for you. you know, it's a direct communication. You can never go to a mosque in your life and be a good Muslim. You know? uh, that has been replaced by an ideology which is dominated by extremely obscurantist priests. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's called the true religion, right. whereas actually it's the opposite. But it's this question of whether you can openly discuss the, fun, the foundation ideas of your culture. Mm -hmm. you know? And it seems to me, and any, any you know, $2 philosophy student will tell you, that if you can't argue from first principles, you can't argue. You know, if you can't argue about the absolute root, there's nothing to be said. If you have to accept that, mm -hmm. all you can have is a kind of pissing contest about how many angels dance on the point of a needle. You know, right. you can't actually discuss the core questions at all. And that's the problem. That's the problem right there. And to wrap up this part of the conversation, mm. I, I want to bring it back to the point that non-Muslims are succumbing mm. to this intimidation as much as Muslims are. In my book, Salman, when I talk about uh, how your story affected me as a young writer and reform-minded Muslim, I point out that as a student in 1988, um, I personally benefited from the explosion of commentary mm -hmm. uh, that came about as a result of, of your story. The problem, I also said in my book, is that when I went to the public library, pre-internet days, the public library, um, to look for commentaries, I found that those commentaries were um, satisfied merely to explain Muslim outrage. Mm -hmm. They never went as far as to ask whether the Quran is as pristine, as perfect, as divine as the effigy burners would have us believe. And yeah. then I asked the very, I think, crucial question, even for today, mm -hmm. maybe especially for today. Is multiculturalism losing its mind? By which I meant, has it lost its intellectual spine? Yes. I mean, that's to, say, that's to say it's decayed into something much less than multiculturalism, which is cultural relativism. I mean, that's to say there's a sense in which multiculturalism, I mean, it's an obvious fact. Right. You know, we right. all... Look we, around you. Yeah. We live in a multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic, multi-faith world. We do. And we're not going to stop. That's not going to unhappen. You know, so there's, a, there's an aspect of it which is just, you know, I mean, unarguable. But when this decays into, and I'm, I, by the way, that aspect of it, I have spent most of my life trying to celebrate. Right. And saying that it actually it's enriching. It's a lovely thing. Um, you know, uh, better food, better clothes, better, you know, all that. And, and some more important things too. Actually, what... <laughs> What is more important than food and clothes? No, sorry, I take that back. Not necessarily uh, in that no, order either. No, yeah. sport, yeah. yeah. Um, but when it decays into cultural relativism, that is, if you like, the end of a moral sense. Because then, you, then you know, to, to lampoon it, what it means, you can say, oh, well, if it's your culture to kill writers, go, you should kill them. Right. Because it's what your culture is. 
if it's your culture to, to impose um, f you know, clitoridectomies on women, then gee, I guess that's fine. You know, I'm glad it's not my culture, but if it's your culture, go right ahead. You know, that, that's the extreme, if you like, the caricature of it, but the day-to-day reali -day reality of it has been a, weak, a weakening of our sense of what our own values actually are. Instead, we constantly seek to appease people who say that our values upset them. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous. It's dangerous not just for the majority communities, but it's dangerous for minority communities. Actually, you know, it's more dangerous for minority communities than for the majority to play that game. Because if cultural relativism is the problem, then the bigger culture will always win. Right. You know, and dissenting uh, voices, well, voices yeah. with you know, authentic talent, something different mm. to say and to express, mm. will be stifled. Yeah, and I sometimes feel that Western ears are better tuned to the, more co to the most conservative Islamic voices. Yeah. They, w they, are, they want to listen to mullahs and other assholes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh, but th the fact that there actually are, throughout the Muslim world, you know, it's not just you and me, yep. you know, th there's, there's a lot of people struggling with these ideas and trying to say, how can we have a modern society um, in, in, in Muslim countries? Correct. How can we break the power of the priests? How can we break the power of corrupt politicians and generals, etc., who use religion as a way of holding people down? Um, these conversations that happen quietly and often you know, very quietly, but there's no doubt that they're happening. And, in, and, and yet they're not, nobody goes looking for that. And, right. and if you're not at, given a platform. And if you compare it to, for instance, the way in which we in the West responded to the Soviet Union, we did not listen to the official voices. We didn't believe that, you know, Stalin and Brezhnev and so on, that those were the people to listen to. We went and found those alternative voices and we gave them enormous uh, privilege. You know, the, the fact that those Samizdat texts were smuggled out of Sakharov and Solzhenitsyn and everyone else, those became what we all agreed was the truth. And so we actually looked at the dissident voices as being more valuable than the official voices. And that played its part in the defeat of Soviet communism. Um, we are not doing that in this case. Um, we're doing the opposite, and that's our intellectual failure. Yeah. Which, which raises one final question on my part before I open up the floor to the audience. Exactly on this point, um, non-Muslims who dare to ask questions about what is happening mm. in the name of Islam are routinely labeled racists, mm -hmm. uh, imperialists, neo-colonialists, and the problem here is that those labels inflict an emotional assault. Yes. Islamophobia. Well, That's the new, the new, it's the among new the offense. worst slurs that can be thrown yeah. your way. And given how you know, emotionally painful it is mm. for so many non-Muslims to deal with that kind of uh, uh, discrediting, mm. um, how can we expect, how can we convince people like you and me uh, progressive non-Muslims uh, to continue to speak up? I know, I guess just by going on being loudmouths, you know. I mean, I think that's, all you have to do is show that you could do it, you know, and, and, and if you do it, you know, in, an, in an, hopefully in a kind of informed and nuanced way, um, rather than, as sometimes happens, in a way which is bigoted. I mean, that's the problem, is that there is bigotry in the world. And, and um, I mean, for example, in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, there were people in this country who were willing to believe that all Muslims were in some way guilty of that. You know? and, and, and it became quite difficult to offer a nuanced response to say, you know, you don't have to be in favor of Osama bin Laden to say that many Muslims are as horrified by what happened as anyone else. You know? So there was, there, there, sometimes there is a level of bigotry. You know? but um, obviously, it's, 
any culture that manages to create a level of nervousness about it uh, itself that makes it difficult for it to be criticized either from inside or from outside is in the end going to become a tyrannous, atrophied culture. You know, in other words, it does a disservice to itself. It does. Yeah. And that's the thing. And, and I think that is what's happening. Yeah. And, and that's extremely alarming. And you know, there have been, we could talk about this maybe later, but there, you know, there have been many attempts in Islamic history mm -hmm. to break the power of the literalists. Mm -hmm. and, and right now, that effort is very much in retreat, you know, because the, the literalists, the extremists, are, are very much in charge. You know? I mean, even in a country like Pakistan, um, you know, in Pakistan, when people actually get to vote, as they recently did, they do not vote for the Islamic radicals. You know, if you look at that election result in Pakistan recently, less than 2% of the vote went to the Islamic parties. The, others, the other votes all went to secular parties of different kinds. Um, the problem in Pakistan is that even though you have 98% of the people not believing in Islamic radicalism, you have a power elite which does. You know, the, the, the Pakistan army did not used to be religious. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, can remember, I had an uncle who was a general of the Pakistan army. I hated his guts, but he was, there he was. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, he hated mine too, by the way. Uh, so, in fact, after the Khomeini fatwa. It's normal dysfunctional family. You get them all over the world. And this, is, this bit's not that normal. After, after, the, after, after the Khomeini fatwa, he took an ad out in the, in the Rawal Pindi newspapers to say, essentially, we never liked him anyway. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> kind of, you know, don't blame us. Um, so, is this the uncle whose wife somebody is having sex with in your family? Um, I don't think I can answer that question. All right. <laughs> Thought I'd give it a shot. <laughs> um, no, he's he's fortunately dead now. Um, <laughs> the world is a better place. Um, no, anyway, the point is, it, the the generals of the Pakistan army. As recently as, I mean, Zia ul Haq, Yahya, these people, um, actually the change happens around Yahya Khan, who was actually quite religious. Um, until then, the generals were these kind of mimic Englishmen, scotch and soda drinking, you know, uh, Sandhurst educated buffoons. Um, and, and now what's happened is that they have, the, the, the military top brass has become very Islamicized. So now you have a situation where the generals are very extremist, mm -hmm. uh, radical Muslims, and so, of course, is the notorious intelligence agency, the ISI, the Inter-Services Intelligence. So at the, the pinnacle of the society, you have radical Islam, and the rest of the country don't have it. Right. So there's, again, a, a mass of people, if you like, being misrepresented yeah. by their leaders. Yeah. In the way that you know, the Afghan people detested the Taliban, most of them. Right. You know, the Iranian people today have very little love for the Ayatollah's leadership. You know, and so you have this el these elites which are fa fanatic, right. ruling countries which by and large are not. And, and again, how long can that last? You know, if you think about the Soviet Union again, where that happened on a very large scale for a long time, that was what, 70 years? You know, and, and 70 years is nothing, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's a lot in a human life. Mm -hmm. it, it's very little in the eye of history. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes think that that's what's going to happen uh, to this phenomenon that we're calling Islamic radicalism or fundamentalism, or whatever you want to call it, that it seems to be attractive for a bit. It seems to particularly attract um, disenchanted, angry young men. Um, but in the countries where it becomes most powerful, it immediately becomes most disliked. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, as I say, Afghanistan, Iran, Algeria, that's another example, you know, where for a while people flirted with it, and then when they saw what it was really like, they backed a mile away from it. Sometimes, once you let people in charge, it's difficult to get them out of power. That's you know, a problem. And, and that's what happened with the Soviets, and that's what's happening again. But in the end, if there is such a disconnect between the desires of the mass of the people and the way in which the leadership conducts itself, in the end, that has to change. Well, and, and um, as, as we open it up to the audience, uh, it's worth remembering that uh, this being Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, uh, Reverend King himself was accused by eight liberal clergymen, liberal clergymen, of being an outside agitator. 
And in his now famous letter from a Birmingham jail, he wrote that we are all caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality, bound in a single garment of destiny. Mm. So he was speaking about the uh, reality of interdependence within the United States, mm -hmm. and how much more true must that be uh, now that citizenship is positively global. In other words, as he put it, what affects one directly affects all indirectly. So that saying that's their culture, that's how they do it over there, and it's none of my business, mm -hmm. even by Martin Luther King's standards, needs to be seriously questioned. Yeah, that's that it's a dangerous thing. Yeah. And I mean, you know, to use the phrase which has been used today very prominently, we are one. You know, um, and that may be our problem. I mean, I sometimes think actually that if we weren't, if we were actually different species, you know, if some of us were green and came from Mars, and so we'd get along better. This, you know, we, we just think we, each other was very weird and we'd, right. you know, right. move we away. We wouldn't be so invested in no, each other. No, it's too much. This is a family fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the of the worst human kind. family. <laughs> All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing something tonight at the Y that I'm told actually has not been done before, which is we will intersperse questions from the satellite uh, participants with real-time, from-the-floor questions here. Uh, two ground rules, and I'm going to be quite strict about ensuring that you, uh, you respect them, uh, for Salman's sake, if not for the audience's sake. One is keep your statement or question to 30 seconds or less. I've got a uh, watch <laughs> with actually um, a second, you know, digital hand, as it were, and I will be keeping count. And I will cut you off at 30 seconds, even if you're in the middle of your question. So get to it. Second, no multi-part questions, please, okay? So that everybody can get their questions in. All right, uh, I believe we have two microphones. Please uh, go ahead and line up, and I'll do my very okay. best to um, ensure that as many people get in as possible. Here's the first question, Salman, from yeah. Boca Raton, Florida. I want to know, is this Susan Engel's mom? Somebody, <laughs> somebody will have to let us know that. All right, here's the question, easy enough. Are you still under the original fatwa? which you were under following the publication of the Satanic Verses? I have no idea, really. Um, I mean, no, essentially. You know, that's to say that it, the problem was never a religious statement. The problem was the desire of the Iranian state to send professional assassins abroad to carry it out. Um, that's to say, again, the problem was political rather than theological. Mm -hmm. And it's now been well over 10 years since they stopped trying to do that. So um, it's kind of all right. From your lips to you know whose ears. You know, I, I know you don't believe in him, but one of us has to. All right. Uh, does he have ears? Over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're clearly a better Muslim than I am. You don't uh, anthropomorphize God. <laughs> Over to you, sir. Oh, yes. First, I want to thank you for all that you've done to fight against censorship. Um, can you tell us if any specific individual served as a role model for you when you were standing up to the hardline Muslims like the Ayatollah Khomeini? Thank oh, you. Oh, well, well, actually, the answer to that is, is yes, uh, because I'm scarcely the first writer ever to have been persecuted. You know, and I think really the the courage with which many writers through history have stood up to different kinds of persecution, um, not only was inspiring, but it made me feel that I owed it to them not to let the side down. Like, you know, that if this is, if writers, whether it's, whether it's the poet Ovid or Mandelstam or whoever it might be, you know, the fact is that writers have stood up against tyranny throughout history. And, and probably the one that I'm most thinking of is, Actually, the first, the first great writer I ever knew personally, who was a, a Pakistani poet, Fez Ahmed Fez, who was the great poet of his generation in Pakistan, and, and, and who was a close family friend of ours, so he was like an extra uncle. You know, I knew him since I was very small. And um, he was a remarkable individual in that he was, first of all, a great love poet. I mean, he wrote beautiful lyric poetry. Um, many of, much of which was set to music, and so he became very popular because these became kind of hit songs sometimes. But as well, he was a very engaged poet, and he would take on um, the great issues of the day 
starting with the partition of India and Pakistan and going on. And, and, and clearly, he's, he made me see that essentially that that was the job, that, that you know, private life, public life, um, the questions of the heart, questions of the head, um, matters of intimacy, matters of state, you know, that both of them, both of them were the responsibility of the poet. And, and, uh, and I guess I tried to be like that. You know, and he was, he was, I mean, there was a moment after the partition and the creation of Pakistan when he wrote some poetry, disillusioned poetry, disenchanted poems about the, about the enormous bloodshed that had taken place and, and, and so on. Um, and they came after him. There was, there was a moment at which an Islamic mob roaming the streets of Karachi was looking for him. Um, and not to ask for his autograph. And, and actually, one of my aunts hid him, I'm proud to say, in her cellar. Um, and I u afterwards used this as the material for a scene in Midnight's Children, but um, she had a sitting room with a wooden cellar door under the rug, and so she rolled back the rug and opened the cellar door and put him inside, put the rug back on, put the sofa on top of the rug and sat on it. And so when, the, uh, and when the, the, the gang came round, because she was known to be kind of his best friend, and, and they suspected him of being there, she said, well, go have a look at the house. You know, go and have a look. And so they went and searched the house and came back and said, yeah, but we still think you know something. And, and she said, well, if you want to harm a woman sitting here by herself, you know, I can't stop you if you're brave, brave men like that. You know, but otherwise, otherwise, you know, bugger off. And, and so they did, and she rolled back the rug, and out came Pakistan's greatest poet, and, <laughs> and, and uh, lived to fight another day. So, I mean, the, I, I guess Fares and his willingness to say uncomfortable truths um, was an inspiration, yes. Salman, you have the weirdest family I've yeah. ever heard about. Well, where do, you, where do you think I get these books from? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. Actually, there was a point, my mother, who was a, a world-class gossip, and, 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 and like... Unlike all, you right now. Not unlike me, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I never gossip. Yeah. Um, she, there was a point where she said to me, I'm going to stop telling you this stuff because you put it in your books, I get in trouble. <laughs> but like all great gossips, she couldn't stop. <laughs> so, so. Before, before I go back to the satellite uh, participants, I'll turn it over to the uh, oh, yeah. microphone here. Hi. Hi, Ms. Rushdie. Um, I was curious, is, as you're focused now on politics, censorship, and religion, if you find that you're focusing more on that as opposed to your writing, and whether you find that it's a distraction or mutually exclusive or something that inspires and complements your work? Yeah, no, it's an excellent question. I mean, actually, truthfully, I almost never do this anymore. Um, because I've, what I think happened to me because of the attack against the satanic verses is that people began to think of me for a long time if you like, in a political way rather than in a kind of literary artistic way. And, um, and, and I felt for a long time that it actually obscured the, the, the real person that I am and the actual nature of the books and so on. And I thought it really did get in the way. And, and, and to an extent, I guess I uh, made it worse because of writing a lot of political material um, because, as it happens, I do have a point of view. Um, <laughs> And, and I've come to feel lately that I really would like to go back to doing the day job. You know, and, I mean, there, there's a reason why I became a writer, which has nothing to do with any of this. You know, um, it, it has to do with the telling of stories and the bringing of pleasure and so on and so on. And, and, and uh, so I, yeah, it is a problem. It's a problem. This is, this is the albatross around my neck, you know. Um, but on the other hand, it is a thing we're all thinking about, yeah. and so uh, I guess there's a reason every so often for talking about it, but not very often. Well, <laughs> perhaps for you, but I think it's something we all need to be doing more thinking about, uh, and not just feeling about. Well, but talking about the albatross, you know, about. I just don't want to become, you know, like the ancient mariner, just grabbing people and yeah. saying, and another thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there's a great poem that I would recommend to you. Um, comic poem, which is designed to be read simultaneously with the rhyme of the ancient mariner, um, which is called the rhyme of the wedding guest. And it goes, hello, 
um, yes, I, I'm in a bit of a, a mariner, you don't say. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, I really, uh-huh, uh-huh. An albatross. Uh-huh, and so on. <laughs> and I, I kind of worry about becoming that guy. You know, there was a ship. You know. <laughs> All right, um, to push you further in that direction, mm. uh, here's a question from Erie, Pennsylvania. Could you tell us how we in the U.S. created these educated privileged in the West but are terrorizing young men who now see us as their enemies? Say that again? Yeah. I, um, <laughs> as I, as I asked that question out loud, I confess to the courage of my confusions. Yeah. I don't understand that question. So no. I'm... Uh, Can you ask another one? Uh, yes, I will. All right, good. Um, one, one in English, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That one's not in English either, is it? <laughs> it's just that the question I'm looking at right now, the answer, your answer, would be so obvious that I, I feel, honestly, that it would be a wasted question. Um, if we could get more questions from the satellite participants, meanwhile, um, meanwhile we'll yes. turn it over to the microphones. Hi. Um, you have discussed banned information and chilling effects, and I paraphrased, a free society tells and retells and changes its stories. Um, have you considered copyright law as a barrier to free speech? A, a what law? Copyright law. As, as an impediment yes. to freedom of speech? Um, no, <laughs> but that's, that's because I write for a living <laughs> and, uh, and I have no other source of income <laughs> and, and, and I naively believe that stuff that I create belongs to me and that if you want it you might have to give me some cash. <laughs> um, and there are, there are moments, I mean, as we, as we were hearing earlier about Irshad's books being banned in various places, there are moments when you willingly give up your copyright in, in order to allow work to exist in a given place. Um, and, I mean, I certainly have done that too. You know, that's I was approached quite early on after the publication of the Satanic Verses by, by Iranian groups who wanted to make an Iranian translation and disseminate it by every means possible. I mean, including actually in those early days, which was where the internet was not what it now is, including hard copy dissemination um, in Iran. And, I said, and they said, we can't pay you anything. And I said, that's fine. You know, so the, so there, there are moments when you allow uh, your copyright to, to go. But I, don't, I think it's very important, because otherwise there's work that simply wouldn't get done. You know? I mean, I'm not even now talking about novels. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, work which requires much research and you know long long periods long long investments of time and effort on the part of the author and if the author had no reasonable expectation of being paid anything you might find that many of those books never got written and that would be a loss you know so the laborer is worthy of his hire you know I, mean, I remember this in India of course we all suffer from the fact of mass book piracy mm. and it's a kind of compliment you know, um, if your books are pirated. The greatest compliment I've never been paid, which is where they put your name on books that you haven't written. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they buy some, you know, cheap penny dreadful thriller and put John Grisham's name on the cover. You know, I think he's published more novels in India than anywhere else. <laughs> 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 um, but and I remember there was a point at which Early on, when, when Midnight's Children was subject to a gigantic pirating operation, I mean, so much so that the pirates were so happy that they would send me greetings cards. <laughs> they would send me, you know, Happy New Year, the pirates. <laughs> so, um, and I remember going to a talk at the university in Delhi, and a student came up with a, what was obviously a pirate edition to be signed, and I said, you know, I'm kind of reluctant to sign this because it's stolen work, you know. And she drew herself up indignantly and said, what do you want, Mr. Rushdie, um, royalties or readers? And I thought, well, why do I have to choose? <laughs> Can't I have both? Um, 
Fundamentally, no, she said. Um, so I mean, I, that's my view. My view is I do this for a living. The thing wouldn't exist if I didn't make it, and so it belongs to me, and don't steal it. You know, it's my stuff. <laughs> uh, first, I'd like to thank you for an extremely penetrating and brilliant uh, analysis of what's going on. I was recently in Indonesia, famous as a home to the uh, most moderate Muslim population in the world. And um, in my research there, and speaking with uh, you know, leading moderate Muslims, they all said that the uh, greatest force for uh, radical Islam at the moment was the uh, uh, policies of George Bush. And I'm wondering now um, that we're going to have a new president, if you have any advice in terms of how the United States could help in terms of this uh, effort that both of you are mounting. Thank you. Well, well, look at what George Bush did and do the opposite. <laughs> um, no, but to make less, a less glib answer, I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's a relevant question to the kind of thing we've been talking about, which is how to know, first of all, how to make friends and not enemies, and I think the Bush administration wasn't good at that. Um, but also how to know where you do, in fact, draw the line. You know, that, that there is, that just, you know, going, to, and I think it's interesting if you read the, the detail about what Barack Obama has said about what he would like to do with, in terms of contacts with Iran, um, something for which he was criticized during the election campaign um, as being a kind of surrender. Um, if you look at actually what he says, is he, that there are all kinds of things that there are, all, there are lots of or else's in there as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it's interesting. He's a much, I think, tougher individual than his opponents have given him credit for. And I think that's just as well because he's dealing with tough, sneaky bastards. Right. right. You know? and, and that's just on Capitol Hill. And that's exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, but I do think that. Sometimes I think that the way, to, the way to end Islamic fundamentalism is to drop Nike sneakers and cans of Coke and jeans on them. You know? I mean, if you look at what happened, look at Vietnam. You know? I mean, there, there was this country which fought this long war against the United States, and now it's in love with American culture. And so, you know, CDs, Oreo cookies, you know, by these things will the world be won. You know? So what I mean is, I suppose what I mean is engagement better than disengagement. You know, if, yeah. you, if, you, if you engage with people, you have a chance of affecting them. And if you do not engage with people, you have no chance. And if your only engagement with people is to bomb the hell out of them, then you do have an effect. People don't like it on the whole. Um. Well, and, and I think uh, you were also asking very briefly about my take on this. I recently wrote a piece, an essay actually for Newsweek International about a new foreign policy towards the Muslim world. And uh, one of the points I made is that I think there's a brilliant opportunity right now for the still president-elect to be um, replacing the disastrous coalition of the willing but with a new network of nations that I would, I personally would call the Alliance of the Interdependent, which would be spearheaded by the world's largest Muslim country, which, sir, you alluded to earlier, Indonesia, obviously a country that Barack Obama has some personal connection to, which makes it all the more sweet. Um, and these are countries of both Muslim and non-Muslim heritage that would get together to um, uh, offer microcredit loans to the women of the Muslim world, empower them and their you know, entrepreneurial talents. And the beauty, I think, of an idea like this is that it's not uh, a secular approach uh, to economic development. Um, it actually is compatible with Islam itself insofar as the Prophet Muhammad's beloved first wife, Khadija, was a wealthy self-made merchant for whom the prophet worked for many, many years. She was his boss. And one of the ways that Muslim women in Southeast Asia have uh, managed to convince their husbands to uh, allow them to accept microcredit loans from the Grameen Bank, which began in Bangladesh, is that they said, 
something like deer. Uh, obviously, as a good Muslim man, you grow a beard just like the Prophet did. Well, of course, say the husbands. But do you also remember that the Prophet had a businesswoman for a wife? So that if you are truly going to follow in the path of the Prophet, you must allow me to work for myself. And that argument has worked wonders in Southeast Asia. And it, uh, there is no reason, I don't think, for that same idea to be yeah. tried in other parts uh, of the Muslim world, particularly the Arab world, which, you know, um, is undergoing a massive baby boom. And if these kids are not given uh, spaces in which to express themselves economically and down the road artistically, I do believe that we will all be complicit in creating mm -hmm. a level of rage uh, that is capable of convulsing more of the world than we already know. So I think that there are many, many ideas that we can be pursuing. Mm. Uh, Salman, yes. uh, in order to, uh, we believe in redemption in this country, so in order to give Erie, Pennsylvania one more shot at it, <laughs> um, I have a rephrased question, and okay. let's see if, if this one makes sense to you. All right. Please explain how it is possible that anti-American Muslim radicals were educated in the West, yet now see us as their enemy. Yeah, I mean, good question. <laughs> Um, I mean, uh, well, one answer to that is hypocrisy. Uh, there, there's an, an enormous number of powerful people in the kind of Islamic radical fraternity who the moment they get ill want to come to an American hospital. Um, and when they have children, they want them to go to Stanford or Cornell. Um, so, or so, NYU. Or, or, yes. yes. I know a few of them. Or Columbia. Or. Let's be fair. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's, there, this double standard exists everywhere. The same, the same culture that you excoriate every day is the place you run to when you're in trouble or when you want to give your children the best education they can have. And that's, that is, I'm afraid, just called hypocrisy. But what is stranger, I think, is the existence inside the West of heavily disaffected young groups of young men, almost certainly, almost all of them. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, in England when the July bombings happened, that was, I think, what shocked people most. Not that it was a terrorist attack, because in England, after the years of the IRA, people were perhaps more inured to bombs going off in public places than people were here. Um, but the fact that these were local boys, you know, that they were not as was the case in 9-11, people who came from outside to attack this country. They were people who came from an English town. Homegrown. Um, and that, I think, was very shocking to people. And, and in that case, it, you could partly explain that event by a, a kind of ghetto mentality, that say the growth in, in certain, particularly northern towns in England, of, of self-imposed ghettos, you know, inside which this kind of disaffection could grow. But then the next attacks, so the next year, the, the ones that did not work, you know, the, the gang that couldn't shoot straight, you know. Um, when we discovered that they were all doctors, that was incredibly shocking. You know, how do people, apart from anything else, the Hippocratic Oath, but these were middle class, fully integrated, apparently, individuals. Um, who, who were yet willing to c carry out an act of mass destruction. And, and a lot of it has to do with, I mean, to given the, the, moral, the word moral in the subject of these conversations, it's worth pointing out that a lot of the reasoning behind these attacks had to do with an extremely warped idea of morality. Mm -hmm. So the reason why it was acceptable to attack a nightclub was that the nightclubs were full of, as they themselves said, slags in short skirts behaving like whores. And so it was okay to kill them. Um, so th that kind of, if you like, purit purit puritanism gone mad uh, became a kind of rationale for these attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, the American humorist H.L. Mencken famously described puritanism as the haunting fear that someone somewhere might be happy. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that's, that's some of it, you know, the fact that the constitution of this country guarantees the pursuit of happiness is a part of the problem. Happiness, For them, yeah. happiness not a good thing. Yeah.
Yeah, and, and I will add one other thing to, to that answer, which is I keep bringing it back as well to the role that non-Muslims play in feeding into this problem. My own country of Canada, as some of us in this auditorium know, a couple of years ago uh, arrested uh, 17 young Muslim men um, uh, for allegedly, still they're in court, so allegedly uh, planning to behead the prime minister and blow up the parliament buildings. The interesting thing about that case is that when the police arrested them, they knew that these young men had called their campaign Operation Badr, B-A-D-R. And that refers to the Battle of Badr, which is the very first military campaign um, that the Prophet and his ragtag army waged and won. Um, clearly these young men took um, uh, you know, inspiration from religious symbolism at the very least. But the sad, tragic, and utterly n unnecessary aspect to the, uh, what happened after this is that when the police arrested uh, these young men, the, the press conference that they had to, uh, to announce these arrests, the police never mentioned Islam or Muslims once. Okay, some would argue fair enough, but at the next press conference, the very next day with Muslim community leaders, uh, the police boasted openly bragged about not mentioning Islam oh. or Muslims once when they knew that religious symbolism played a role in what motivated these young men. Mm. I took them to task yeah. publicly over this, at which point a number of people within the police department approached me to say they wanted to mention Muslim, mm. but their lawyers wouldn't Mus allow them. Oh, well, well, that's even worse than political correctness. But, I mean, it's... it's, it's it, Part of this I mean, infrastructure that we've built where yes. nobody wants to touch the issue. There is a language problem. People don't want to talk straight. And, and that's why actually these conversations aren't as common as they should be. Right. Um, but I think there's, you know, in terms of what can the West do better, you know, I mean, there's quite a lot of answers to that. Um, I mean, for a start, there, there have been great geopolitical mistakes. You know, I mean, the support of Saddam Hussein, you know, I mean, remember that, that Donald Rumsfeld, was, was supporting Saddam Hussein when in fact he did have weapons of mass destruction and was using them against the Kurdish population. At that point, you know, Rumsfeld was in favor of him, but when in fact he did not have weapons, have weapons of mass destruction, it was necessary to attack him. Um, that, of course, is famous and we don't need to even discuss what an idiotic mistake that was. Um, in Iran, the West was highly culpable in, in destroying a legitimate government, the Mossadegh government, and installing in its place the Shah. And that's not just the United States, it's the United Kingdom and France as well. Um, and that clearly the, clearly the rule of the Shah created, if you like, the backlash which became the Khomeini revolution. Um, so there is culpability at the level of, of geopolitics, and you know, we have to hope that as we go forward into you know, a more intelligent government, uh, that those mistakes won't be compounded or repeated. Um, but there's also, I think, a willingness in the West very often to, to tolerate what is intolerable. Um, and, and I think the case of Pakistan is, a, is at the moment, I think, the crucial case. Because the Bush administration, believing that Afghan that, that because of the campaign in Afghanistan and because of the battle against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, uh, that it was important to be friendly with Pakistan. Uh, the, the Bush administration has given enormous amounts of aid to Pakistan without ever, first of all, ever asking for any accountability about how the aid was used. Um, and secondly, without, asking, without putting any kind of, if you like, libertarian conditions on that aid. And, and so you've had an increasingly authoritarian and repressive and dishonest and corrupt government in Pakistan benefiting from American aid without actually in any way behaving better as a result. So you have um, a country which has become, during the years of the Bush administration, the world capital of terrorist activity. You know, the headquarters of the Taliban, of Al-Qaeda, of Lashkar-e Taiba, of jaish e um, of every group you can think of is based there with the Pakistanis, and not just actually religious, even gangsters. I mean, the, the, you know, right. the, the, the biggest, two biggest mafia dons from Bombay, um, Dawood Ibrahim and Tiger Memon, are both finding safe haven in Karachi, uh, with the Pakistan government saying that they are unaware of their presence. If they are, they're the only people who are. You know? <laughs> um, and 
So the question of what is to be done about Pakistan, I think, has to be right at the top of this government's agenda. Um, and one of the simple things that can be done is that Pakistan is broke. And if you actually want to get that country to behave itself, the e in this case, the economic weapon actually can work. Mm -hmm. If you just stop handing them out money to, on the one hand, pretend to be a friend of the West, while on the other hand, you know, nurturing every terrorist group in the world, um, you know, you can actually push them. And be, it's, there's some evidence that that's already happening, right. you know, right. that there clearly is an enormous pressure on Pakistan, and they've begun to round up members of lashkar e taiba who were the group responsible for the attack on Bombay. Um, almost certainly with Pakistan government assistance, but that bit is being brushed under the carpet right now. And the point is it has to stop being brushed under the carpet. You know, the Inter-Services Intelligence is a terrorist organization. You know, you, you have in Pakistan an intelligence organization which is maverick, which the, which the elected government does not fully control, and which acts as a terrorist organization. And it needs, in my view, to be declared a terrorist organization um, and disbanded. Uh, so there's a lot, I mean, we, we, I mean, there's a lot, you rightly are talking about ways in which there could be greater understanding and greater clarity of language and, and, and less clumsy mistakes, you know, and that's right. That all that needs to happen. But there also needs to be tough action where tough action is necessary, you know, and, and in our time, these are our enemies. And they're the enemies of the Muslim world just as much as of the Western world. Um, you know, who suffered the most from the Taliban? Ordinary Muslims Ordinary in Afghanistan. Afghan Muslims. Who suffered the most from the rule of the Ayatollahs? Mm -hmm. You know, today in Iraq, 99% of the killings are being carried out by Muslims against other Muslims. Today in Darfur, you have a, civil, a racist civil war in which Arab Muslims are exterminating African Muslims. And where is the protest against that? Where is the Islamic protest against that? Exactly. Um, um, it, it seems to me that you know, Muslim lives only count when they're snuffed out by non-Muslims. Yeah, but this kind of genocide yeah. appears to be, why should we get upset about that? Yeah. You know? So the problems are there that people are not, you're, you're right, that we've got so mealy-mouthed that we have become unwilling to call things by their real name for fear of being called racist or Islamophobic. Or Actually, truthfully, if, if, if you hold a series of ideas which I detest, it's okay to be phobic about them. You know? <laughs> I mean, I mean if, if you were sitting there espousing Nazi ideology and I said I detest that, I hate it, I would not be prejudiced. I would be responding acceptably to what I detest. And there are people around who for completely legitimate reasons, this doesn't include you, um, detest what Islam has become. And it is okay to say so. I do detest mm. what Islam has become. Mm. And hence the title of my book, The Trouble with Islam Today. Mm. What I also believe yes. is that what has always been right with Islam can be harnessed yeah. to cure what has gone wrong yes, within you, Islam yes. today. You think, you think yes, that. I yes. know, I know. <laughs> um, the patronizing well, starts at the end of the conversation. No, no, but I, look, I, the, the, uh, in the, uh, the way in which the non-Soviet left yeah the non-Soviet socialist left rationalized the appalling atrocities going on inside the Soviet Union was that it made a distinction between what it called actually existing socialism, which was the Soviet Union and bad, right. and if you like, the true faith, which was a religion of peace and love, obviously. And if only we could get rid of actually existing socialism, which was brutal and repressive and tyrannical, you would see that true socialism was excellent, right? And I feel that that argument is now being used about Islam. Mm -hmm. That whereas actually existing Islam, wh wherever you see it, mm -hmm. is brutal and repressive and tyrannical and philistine and murderous, that's got nothing to do with the true faith which is full of peace and love. And if we could just get rid of this brutal mistake, the true faith would emerge. Well, I'm sorry, I've given up on that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that anymore. <laughs> and every day I thank God that I live in a society in which, you know, um, 
Salman can give up on that idea um, without fear of government reprisal for doing so. Um, I actually think, Salman, that the existence of successful atheists like you is proof positive of a very compassionate God. Um, but that is another issue for another day. <laughs> I, uh, I know I have to play the bad guy because Salman and I did engage in some back and forth here and therefore took time away from the audience. Uh, we are running late and there is a book signing after this so I am going to have to end it here but please know Salman and I are sticking around to um, sign books and thus answer your questions should you uh, come up and buy one of our books. Um, the last thing I want to say before I let everybody go and I think you'll be interested in this is that um, I have to pay tribute to uh, Salman because um, I got from him one of the greatest pieces of advice, and it will not leave me till the day I die. Before my book came out, uh, I met Salman, and I asked him um, if he thinks I'm crazy for writing a non-fiction book uh, entitled The Trouble with Islam, subsequently entitled The Trouble with Islam Today. And he said to me, look, a book is more important than a life. Now, I nervously laughed, thinking this guy, as we've come to see tonight, has a great sense of humor, uh, and he's um, uh, clearly trying to inject some levity into these proceedings, and he's about to tell me the serious answer. And he was gracious enough to explain why this was the serious answer. He said, whenever a writer puts out a thought, it can be disagreed with vigorously, vehemently, even violently, but it cannot be unthought. And that not your life, Irshad. That is the great permanent gift that the writer gives to this world. Words to live by. <laughs>